Welcome to the Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. Thank you for downloading this edition of the Why Factor, a programme that seeks to find out why we do the things we do. I hope you enjoy it. BBC World Service. Welcome to the Why Factor. I'll be, like, lying on my back, staring up. I can't breathe, I can't move, like, paralysed. I try to move, I try to speak, but nothing's happening. This is Evelyn, who's 24. You can't blink, you're pinned down, you feel like something's attacking you. A force is on top of you, stopping your ability to do all the things that keep you alive. You feel like you're going to die. What she's describing is a condition called sleep paralysis. Evelyn is essentially still dreaming after she's woken up. Do you try and fight that paralysis? Do you try yeah. and break out of it? Yeah, but like literally it's like your body's resisting it. I'm just stuck, so I try to move my fingers first, but nothing's happening. And then I try to scream and shout, but the most that will happen is, like, murmurs. So it'll sound like I'm mumbling in my sleep, and I feel like the more I panic, the longer it will last. And eventually, like, these things kind of disappear. On the programme today, dreaming. Why do some sleep disorders turn normal dreams into nightmares? And what do they tell us about the workings of the brain? My name's Dr Guy Leshtsner, and I'm a consultant neurologist at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospitals in London, where I also run one of the UK's largest sleep clinics. Dreaming typically occurs in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, a stage of sleep that's only found in warm-blooded animals. It's when the brain is incredibly active, but our bodies are almost entirely paralysed in normal REM sleep. We presume this is to stop us injuring ourselves while we dream or to preserve energy. In Evelyn's case, when she wakes, REM sleep is not completely switched off and so the paralysis continues while she's awake. So that's why she can't move. And as she's still dreaming, it gets even more unnerving. I start seeing like these really graphic images, crazy scary images in my face dark visions of, like, demons and stuff and figures in my room. And then when I see those things, I feel like, oh, my God, I'm in hell. One time I saw millions and millions and millions of eyes just looking at me and it was, like, right there in my face, so dead in my face. Seeing a dead family member was the scariest, I think. Just looking at me, there was no expression... One time at university, I saw my housemate in my face, but the thing about it was was she wasn't even there. She'd gone home for the weekend. So when I saw her the next day, I was like, what were you doing in my room yesterday? And she was like, I've just got back. How was I in your room? So do you know how crazy that is? Like, you're seeing actual things happening, but it's just not real. It's like your imagination taking you to the wildest places and showing it to you in your face. These dream phenomena that occur as Evelyn moves between REM sleep and full consciousness are termed hypnagogic hallucinations. REM sleep was discovered in the 1950s when researchers noted that people woken up from the stage of sleep associated with rapid, jerky eye movements recalled vivid and elaborate dreams. Amazingly, though, over 60 years later, we still don't really know what the purpose of this dreaming sleep is. Even before babies are born, you can detect the features of of REM sleep. Once they're born, right away they spend about half of their time in REM sleep. Are they dreaming? What could they possibly be dreaming about right after they are born? Mayor Krieger is a professor of sleep medicine at Yale University. So REM sleep may have different functions at different parts of your life. And it could be that when you're born, REM sleep is when your brain grows. And later on, we know that REM sleep is very important for consolidating memories. And what do I mean by that? So you can think of memory in two ways. One is what in the computer world you would call RAM. 
and then you would have the hard drive. And you want to be able to transfer the stuff from RAM, the stuff that disappears when you turn off your computer, onto the hard drive where it's permanently stored. And we think that that happens during rapid eye movement sleep. There's lots of other theories about the purpose of REM sleep. For example, that it's when neural circuits are cleaned up or pruned so that important memories are strengthened while random bits of unnecessary information acquired during the day are discarded. Perhaps it allows us to rehearse behaviours in our sleep. It may be important for processing our emotions. None of these theories are universally accepted. In fact, some medications seem to suppress or reduce REM sleep for months or years without obvious ill effects. So perhaps it has no function at all. Dreaming doesn't occur usually until the person has been asleep for about 90 minutes. Then there's this magical clock in the brain that makes dreams occur about every 90 minutes for the rest of the night. And so if someone, for example, dreams very early in the night, that is abnormal. If someone dreams during a nap, that is generally abnormal. And one of the conditions where this is very apparent is in a condition called narcolepsy, where that's one of the important symptoms. People will have dream imagery at the beginning of the night, and what's even scarier to them is that they may actually have dream imagery before they're actually asleep, and that becomes very frightening. I believe that I was being visited by a succubus, like a demon of a night time. In my mind, this thing was coming to me, having sex with me, and then, well, then leaving, you know, and it would do this every night. It wasn't a demon in, like, a person form. I mean, it was like a thick smoke. I could see the smoke, even though I was asleep, you know, like, with my eyes open. I could grab it, and the sexual aspects were happening, as far as I was concerned, because I could feel not something sitting on top of me as such, but something sort of entering me, you know, like, without saying it's a crude, you know, like, like in a sexual way. Mm. There was no human being there, mm. but I could feel an outline of a human being, you know, like there was actually somebody there. So I thought that I was being visited by a succubus. I was even ready to go and see a priest, actually, just to have a chat with him. Christian, another of my patients, also experiences hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis. But in him, these are because of this neurological disorder, narcolepsy. It results from damage to a tiny area of the brain, comprising a few thousand cells in an area called the hypothalamus. This minuscule centre is crucial for controlling the switch between being awake and asleep, causing people with narcolepsy to fall asleep incredibly easily but it also controls the switch between dreaming and non-dreaming sleep. And because Christian's sleep is so unstable, and he frequently drifts between wake and REM sleep, his dreams are incredibly vivid and realistic. When I'm dreaming, I'm actually in the dream. And then I'll wake up, I'll be back in reality, but my brain is still dreaming. Say in the dream, I'm walking down the road and I meet Fred Bloggs. In the dream... I'm saying, hello, Fred, you know, how's it going or whatever. As soon as I wake up, the dream is still going on, but my eyes have opened. Do so you sometimes drop back to sleep and the dream Yeah, continues? yeah, yeah, it just continue. Basically, I dream with, like, the same four people every night. Real people or imaginary Real, real people that I went to primary and secondary school with that I haven't seen for maybe 20 years. I'm having a bit of a love affair with at least two of these girls. One of them used to be, when I was little, yeah. a girlfriend of mine, and the other one was just a classmate that I quite fancied, you know. <laughs> it's really weird that the people that I'm actually seeing in my dreams are kids, so I'm the same as them, you know, like I'm the child as I was in the past. It's like reliving stuff we're not even reliving it, living new stuff yeah. that never happened in the past. So I'm having this really weird love affair that's actually not happening in reality in any way, shape or form because I've never actually interacted with them as adults. You know? So it sounds like not only you're having a good social life but you're also having quite a good love life as well in the <laughs> middle of the night. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I do. I, I live another life of a night time. There has 
been a leading up to this for years because before the actual physical violence, there would be this very weird sound coming from the depths. Uh, 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 and it would be like a crescendo. And it was always scary, like, what was he going to do once he'd got to the top? Was he going to lash out or mm. what was going to happen? Liz and her husband, John, have been together for decades. He's in his 80s. What started as noises in his sleep gradually developed into physical assault as John began to act out his dreams. There'd probably been about five or six times where he would kick me with such ferocity that it would be like if you were walking behind a horse or a donkey and they lashed out and kicked you. Do you remember what you're lashing out at or you're kicking out at? Yes, I'm kicking out some object, usually an animal, to get something away. Right. But it's always something to do with anger or fear. Do you remember any specific dreams that you'd be having? The kind of traditional nightmare of um, suddenly finding yourself in a large wood with a tiger. Not only does this happen, the actual violent reaction, there's a twitching that takes place, mm. and then it developed into the more attacking mode. How long do you think there have been some movements related to his dreams? Even the twitching? Yeah. Mm, maybe eight, eight, nine years. What John and Liz are describing is a condition called REM sleep behaviour disorder, known as RBD for short. John is having vivid dreams and is in REM sleep, dreaming sleep. But the paralysis that should be present when he's been chased by a tiger is incomplete, causing him to act out certain aspects of his dream, like a kick or a grab. It's very different from sleepwalking and night terrors because in RBD, people have their eyes closed, rarely get out of bed and don't act out complex behaviours. Because REM sleep tends to occur more in the latter part of the night, RBD is more often experienced in the early hours. What happens is that... I'm doing something perfectly routine, but then suddenly you're aware of a presence that you weren't expecting, and then it becomes sinister and you get fearful. Is it always tigers or is it sometimes other it large could be, animals? It could be other animals or, you know, the sort of things that frighten people, like snakes. The one time that was the kind of, that's it, we can't sleep in the same bed anymore, He'd actually come all the way over to my side of the bed and grabbed me on my arm, and it scared me so much, and the nails went in. I was out of bed before I knew it, screaming my head off, and I'm not a screamer. So what causes REM sleep behaviour disorder, this phenomenon of acting out your dreams? Rather unusually, RBD is one of the few medical conditions described in animals long before it was described in humans. That was in the 1950s. But it's only been in the last few years that we've understood the implications of RBD. We're now learning that in some people it can be an early warning of a range of neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease and certain types of dementia. It seems that these diseases affect the brainstem, the area of the nervous system crucial to the paralysis of REM sleep, sometimes decades before more overt symptoms. My name is Annette Schrag. I'm a consultant neurologist at the Royal Free Hospital in London. And my particular interest within neurology is Parkinson's disease. At the moment, we can only diagnose Parkinson's disease when people have developed motor problems. So they have difficulties walking, moving. And this is the stage when they go and see their doctor who might refer them and, and make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But we know that the disease process actually starts much, much earlier. People develop seemingly unrelated symptoms probably up to 10 years beforehand. These include things like constipation, depression, anxiety, loss of smell. And we know that these are related to involvement of other brain areas, such as the brain stem, which are very important in sleep, areas that are involved with emotion, like the limbic system, and also the olfactory bulb, which is responsible for our sense of smell. Annette is part of a team studying patients like John to try and identify people at high risk of developing Parkinson's disease in the future. 
predictors such as this acting out of dreams may give the chance to intervene at an early stage. Not everyone with RBD will develop Parkinson's at any point during their life. If they do, we don't know how long the delay will be, so it is very difficult to predict at the current stage who is at risk and if they develop it, when that will be. At the moment, there are no drugs to change the course of Parkinson's or prevent or delay the onset, but there are trials, and if they can identify early who's at risk... This is a window of opportunity to test any such new medications to try and slow the disease progression at this very, very early stage when we have the highest chance of saving some of the neurons before a large number of nerve cells degenerate. I had one a month or so ago which did involve being extremely angry with somebody and that was a real live person. And at the point I leapt out of bed, I'm sure I was on the point of punching him on the nose. It was a gesture of complete frustration. And that was the freaky thing because it was almost like the day person was completely different to the night person. It's like a fear and a feeling of the only way he can deal with the situation is to lash out. We're not absolutely sure why John and others with this sleep disorder have such aggressive dreams. Maybe it's because the neurological disorder alters dreaming directly. A recent theory is that changes in the brainstem in RBD cause people to make flinging or thrashing movements in their sleep, and that's what's being incorporated into the dreams, making them more violent. These sleep disorders that affect our dreaming don't just have physical consequences – they have a psychological impact too, as Evelyn discovered when she first experienced sleep paralysis. We thought, me and my mum thought, oh, maybe it's like some sort of spirit in the room or it could be somebody trying to put a curse on you. You just don't know what to think. Mm -hmm. So originally we prayed on it, we put holy water on my bed and then when we realised like nothing was happening, I also had to open up to the perspective that it might not just be spiritual, it could be a genuine sleeping problem. Mm. My friend's Asian, so for her, she thought, like, maybe it's a curse. When it was happening to me, she could hear me, like, mumbling from the other room, and she came in, and then when she touched me, it broke me out of the paralysis. Throughout history, these kinds of conditions have often been associated with the supernatural. In some cultures today, they're viewed as witchcraft, which simply adds to the anxiety and makes them more likely to occur. At their worst, how often were they happening? In the summer, it was happening twice a day, once in the afternoon when I'd be napping and then once at night. I'd begun to hate sleep and I'm a big fan of sleeping. Like, I'd spend a lot of my time awake down here or doing anything to avoid going to sleep. We don't have all the answers about why sleep paralysis happens. We do know the more sleep-deprived you are, the more likely it is to occur. I feel like it's also to do with my pattern at work. Like, I don't have a regular pattern when it comes to my shifts. I could be working at 8.30 in the morning or I could start at 3.30 in the afternoon and finish at half past midnight. In Evelyn's case, improving her sleep patterns and reducing her anxiety around sleep paralysis has made a big difference. Knowing that it's not dangerous has helped and she's reassured by a sleep study showing she doesn't have narcolepsy. These sleep disorders have an impact not just on my patients, but their partners as well, like Liz, whose husband, John, has been acting out his dreams. So it sounds like you had a few mornings with quite severe bruises, is yes, that right? Yes, I did. Bruises and scratches. It was just very frightening, and it started to make where it wasn't safe to actually fall asleep. So very bad for your sleep as well. Very bad. And the only one time I did sort of giggle was he was lying on his back and he kicked out and fell off the bed. I obviously take it so seriously that until I can find a solution to this, you know, we're going to have to continue sleeping in separate beds. Mm. But taking the dose of melatonin that you've prescribed to date has clearly made a difference... In John's case, there's no evidence of Parkinson's disease or any other neurological disorder. His RBD has responded well to melatonin, 
a hormone produced by the brain as a signal to sleep. We don't know how it works for this sleep problem, but there may be receptors for this hormone in the brainstem that accounts for its success. Christian has tried several treatments for narcolepsy, but they've had side effects, and he prefers to live with his symptoms despite their severity. A lot of the time I will fall asleep and I don't know I've fallen asleep until I've actually woken up. I work for a company that I drove a forklift truck for them, and the big containers, I've driven into them before, you know, and I've, and I've woken up with the, with the cold feeling, you know, the jolt, the reality thing. As soon as I've hit the container, I'm bang, oh, Christ, you know, luckily it wasn't a person or, a, you know, anything valuable, you know. You're not driving at the moment. No, I'm not allowed to drive. No. No. I'm actually literally not allowed to drive. The hallmark of narcolepsy, the sleepiness that results from damage to the switch that keeps people awake, has resulted in Christian being unable to hold down a job. But the REM sleep issues, the vivid dreams and the hallucinations, are for him less of a problem, perhaps even a pleasure. I always get this impression from you, Christian, which is a little unusual, even for people with narcolepsy, which is that, in a way, you kind of enjoy leading multiple lives. Yeah, I do feel kind of special, if that makes sense. In a way, I see things that no one has ever seen and no one's likely to see. Even though they're not real, I've still experienced them and seen them. The average Joe is never going to experience that because the average Joe doesn't remember. They might remember one or two dreams, say, a lifetime, you know. It's often when things go wrong that we get the best insight into how they should work. And in many ways, these disorders arising from dreaming sleep offer us a unique understanding of why we dream and the role of REM sleep. But as with many things about the brain and unconscious thought, there is still much about dreaming that remains a mystery. But raising awareness of what we do know can be invaluable. I think the reason that we're keen to talk about this is because there's quite a lot of shame involved in this from the person that's actually doing the kicking beating up your partner, your wife, your husband, whoever it is who's got it. And my husband would say, don't tell anybody about this. And I just had to say, I'm not going to keep it a secret because it's not something that one needs to be ashamed of. It's something that you're unconscious and it, it happens and you don't do it on purpose. I'm Dr Guy Leshsinner and you've been listening to The Why Factor. The producer was Sally Abrahams. You can listen again to this programme via the website and hear other Why Factors on subjects like sleepwalking and insomnia. We'd love to hear your ideas for future topics. Email us, whyfactor at bbc.com. Thank you for listening to The Why Factor. There are many more episodes to listen to, such as sleepwalking or insomnia, You'll find them at bbcworldservice.com slash whyfactor. And if you're enjoying this series, there are other podcasts from the BBC World Service you might like. For example, Crowd Science. Think of a sciencey question you've always wondered about and ask the Crowd Science team. They'll go to any length to find out the answers. It's truly fascinating.